Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I've butted in a little bit to get to, uh, uh, I wouldn't say introduce, but intercede a little bit before our panel gets started uh, on A Place in the Sun about the work of Charles Correa. Um, I asked to, uh, to jump in because I, I wanted to let you know how important I think, I think the work is and, and this gathering and how uh, related it can be to Roger Williams. Uh, certainly Rahul and, and Nandita uh, are known around the world for, for their work and for uh, Nandita's father's work and legacy. Um, but something I, I think is really important, and I, tr I try to say it whenever I can, and some of you may have heard me talk about, about Hassan a little bit and, and about the kind of opening of the world of architecture starting in the late uh, 20th century, which I guess for you all seems like a, a time ago that you may not may not remember. Um, but um, uh, it's really important to know that, that this work and, and the kind of beginnings of the whole world being aware of it uh, really was uh, in large part championed by people like Hassan among a handful of people around the world uh, in association with the Aga Khan. Um, but Hassan wrote uh, a book uh, or started a magazine which uh, I, I found interesting as, uh, as I shared with several people the other day and going to college in, in St. Louis in architecture. Uh, we learned that modern architecture was in Europe and a little bit in the US. We didn't hear much about American architecture. We certainly didn't hear about uh, places where Nandita and, and Rahul are from. And uh, like India or Asia, pretty much at all, Japan was making a bit of an inroads in a magazine called A Plus U. And it just was not known. And not only uh, buildings, but how people lived or what our shared or different aspirations were. And uh, this interesting guy, Hassan Adin Khan and some others, um, had this great uh, uh, opportunity and vision to literally start looking at architecture in Asia and Africa and share conversations about that around the world. Uh, and it seeped in through little periodicals in, in, in different architecture libraries around the world. And uh, everybody uh, started uh, looking. And now I think the plurality of things that we have access to uh, is certainly real, and uh, the kind of elegance and simplicity and sensitivity of somebody like Charles Correa, uh, we may or may not know of, but I think we can, I hope we know of, but and hopefully tonight will be a great uh, re reintroduction or introduction, um, but it, it kind of had its, had its origins at a certain time and place, and, and Hassan was part of that, and, and uh, Charles Correa certainly was, was doing it, and uh, among others. And so I, ju I just wanted to put that in there because I think sometimes we, we don't know how the world got to be that we're in. Uh, and we're not always around people who, who shape it as much as it's been shaped for the better. And we certainly are around those people today. Um, so uh, Hassan will, will kick us off with a panel with uh, Nandita Correa Marotra and Rahul Marotra. And then we'll have a lecture by Rahul a little bit later on. Uh, thanks very much. Well, thanks for that introduction. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I might do is uh, we have two of the people here who know Charles very well. <clears throat> Nandita, who's an, who is an architect. They're both architects. Both studied at some place in Cambridge. Just north of Just north of us. <laughs> Um, same place that Nate studied in, you know, isn't it? <laughs> You're all at Harvard, but and they're they're practicing architects, um, and have worked. They live in the states, so they've worked in the states. They worked in India a great deal, and we're lucky to have both of them here. We've been trying to get Rahul and Nandita here for ages, but uh, I'd like to just say a few words about. Charles on a very personal sort of note, if I may, and then you can talk about the real stuff, okay? <laughs> um, I guess I met Charles in about 1978 in Iran, of all places, and he's on a competition jury for oh. Shastan Palvi. The library. The library yes, right there. And uh, I met him and I fell very ill. Um, I was sick at that time, and Charles and uh, that time Renata Hollard, who I was traveling with, came by and sort of sat by my bed and talked. And this is the first time I've seen this architect. And I knew 
had known of him, but I didn't know much about him. But I got to know him uh, from that time onwards. And uh, he then joined the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. The Aga Khan was setting up an award, which is one of the biggest architectural prizes. And both these people here have been involved with it. You're on the steering committee this year, right? The and jury. The, the, jury. the jury. Sorry, you're on the jury. And Rahul's been on both. Um, and on the technical review, so-called, which used to be called technical review. Which I so, did the previous cycle. Which you did as well. <laughs> so the people who've been involved with the Aung Khan and the Aung Khan Award, as I have for a long time too, um, and they were really part of this new <coughs> journey that we took, which, um, which uh, Steve talked about. And we took a lot of journeys. I got to know not only Charles, but Monica Correa, his wife, who used to travel with him. So we would go to various conferences around the world. We went to str not strange places. Yeah, we did. We went to China. We went to Zanzibar. We went all over Europe. We went through um, events, meetings, seminars. as an amazingly enriching experience. And I got to know um, both of them to some extent. And Charles was always, besides being a, a very fine architect, uh, had a sort of, a, I would say, a wicked sense of humor. He would be, he could be, uh, not sarcastic, but he could certainly be, bring up his view of the world and uh, had a very particular way of looking at both architecture and the world itself. And it's a lot of fun to be traveling with him because he's always interesting from that point of view. He was also very good, by the way, at getting people involved in things. Uh, when I was uh, traveling with him, he uh, certainly got me involved in a bunch of book projects, which I wouldn't have done without him. He was one of the early supporters of Mimar, the magazine that I ran for a number of years uh, with a number of other people. So in a, in a funny way, he's, I realized much later uh, when he was no longer with us, that actually had an amazing impact on me and what I did and what I do for that matter. So I'm always grateful to, uh, uh, to what, he, uh, what he brought to the field of architecture in, the, in that our parts of the world. So it's really a pleasure. I mean, I've known these two for a long time too, probably before you guys were married for sure. Oh, definitely, yeah. A long time. She was a young. No, but, um, <laughs> but I remember the, that red monograph that you did on Charles. Oh, that's true. Yes, well, I, I worked did, on that. I yeah. Did, yeah, that's yeah. right, you did. Um, I did do a book on, on Charles a long time ago and did a bunch of other, in fact, covered him in several books. And now, by the way, I cover his work in a course that I run here mm -hmm. on Asian architecture. And he's one of the people I talk about um, under a strange sort of title of sort of modern regionalism of some sort. The idea that he's a modernist, but he, he always said all great architecture is regional. And he said there's no such, you, architecture is rooted in place. And the, that's when architecture really has something that's important to say. You can't just do architecture anywhere in the world, or it, you can, but you, it changes depending where you are. Um, so I just want to thank First of all, both of you and you for helping set up the exhibition. Oh, you know, made it possible. And I would also Nate, by the way, who spent a great deal of effort in getting this exhibition going, um, and some students and John. No, a bunch of people. But I think Nate said the designing part of it, and you sent stuff across and <laughs> yes. and reviewed it. So I would encourage you all, by the way, to look at the exhibition if you haven't, because it's worth it. And we're going to after the talks, take a walk around with you, if you may. Mm -hmm. And you could talk about Charles and his work. And you could actually see the projects, which are really varied in a great range of things. And he had a great range of interests, which I think you're going to tell us a little bit about his approaches that he thought was important. So I'm yeah. just going to hand it to you at this moment, if I may. OK. Thanks, Austin. Awesome. Nandita, Korea. OK. Well, thank you. And um, I just want to say also that um, like, so I worked with Charles for many years, I think 
25 years, perhaps. I was counting, I just I hadn't realized it was so long, but <laughs> it was a long, long time. And so I know the work well, of course, but somehow it's difficult, I think, to synthesize um, the work while it's yet happening. You sort of need the perspective of time to begin to understand what what the, you know, his, his career, his Uber, which was six decades long. He started his practice in 1958. So it was, it was sort of 10 years after India got independence. It was a whole new country. It was, you know, um, and, and so I, I, you know, a lot of that shaped what he, what he did, but, but it was, um, I mean, I'm going to touch also about, um, the exhibition which we we sort of sent across over here, and, and you know, as Hassan was saying, Nate did an amazing job of putting it together. But the 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 words we used to sort of really to curate the exhibition were, were Charles's own essay that he wrote. Um, just a couple of years before he passed away, and so again, he, using that perspective of time, he he sort of you know wrote this essay, which I think you can get which copies get, of, yeah, copies when you go people. to to the gallery, um, called uh, Snail Trail, and it and he he describes the themes that sort of come back to him in his work, the, the ritualistic pathway, moving through the building, the empty center, which was either courtyards or somehow defining the spaces um, around you know, the, the empty center. Uh, the non-building, which he felt was very much of, of Asia and of that kind of warm climate that you could easily move outside the building and then back in and so the, the building didn't need to be a freestanding box it could it could be much more amorphous than how you use it so the the essay talks about all that and he said you know um, like the trail that a snail leaves in its wake as it inches forward so over the years an architect leaves behind a body of work generated by the attitudes he gradually accumulates towards the agenda he deals with, which is climate, building materials, structural systems, functional requirements, etc. So, so using that sort of analogy, the, uh, after he passed away, which is like what Hassan was saying, like when after someone's gone, you then realize, you know, all the things that perhaps that he did, you know, many many interests from from his interest in, you know, in in publications and and than the written word, which he thought was really important. He wrote a lot. And, um, but, but also his, his you know, very large body of work, which, as I said, was six decades as his practice lasted. So about a year after he passed away, I um, curated for Charles's foundation, which I now um, run it's it's in India the foundation and it looks after his archives and does a lot of other urban projects and stuff like that um, I did an exhibition called uh, buildings as ideas which was really looking at his unbuilt work and since it was the first exhibition after his death um, I, I sort of put together a timeline of those six decades placing the unbuilt work within the built work in chronological order, just to get us understand what the ideas were, you know, sort of decade by decade. And it was amazing that um, the, you know, the, the, the context to, in which you sort of then view the unbuilt work was, became really important because you, you realize that they, they were, the the um, the sketches and the drawings and stuff became the the way the ideas were held because those projects because they weren't built they were in a way they were the uh, the the pure idea that that stayed in those drawings and so uh, in you know that was that was a really important sort of exhibition I thought in in understanding all this but um, we also then 
uh, were be uh, began to synthesize what were these themes that went through the the work, and so um, we 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 found these kind of I would say about six lineages, what I call, which was just these ideas, and in identifying them, which you can do, I think here in this exhibition as well, one. Uh, major thing was was form fo uh, follows climate, which Charles would often write about. It how the form really was generated by climate, and it's an argument um, on what shapes architecture. For Korea, um, often believed that in form follows climate. For him, this was a way to make architecture more energy conscious, and this was starting in 1958. He was 28 years old. It was not the buzzword at that time by any means, but it was his preoccupation of, of starting, you know, with, with these ideas that, um, that shaped into very specific architectural approaches, um, evident in the cross-section, which often is different, um, in different forms in different projects, but um, could be employed across a variety of housing projects, irrespective of their si size, social scale, and economics of the project, and that was important, that, that very often the low-income housing was had the same ideas that were generating that as to uh, a, a, you know, a house for a very affluent client, and that that was very much, you know, Charles said it was like the, the ideas were so important that he, he just wanted to push those through his, the, the project. So, the, you know, cross-ventilation, um, as well as shading devices and the actual form, and that you can see in the tube house that we have a, a very nice model and images of the, the project and, and um, a plan and section. To a lot of other uh, projects, the, the Ram Krishna house, which is also there, um, some other housing projects like Cable Nagar, um, a house that he didn't build for himself, but he he sketched it and wanted to build it for uh, Ahmedabad, which is a hot, dry climate. Um, for Previ, um, which was the uh, project, the housing in Lima, which is also in the exhibition. And also in, in a, a number of like office buildings. In those days, um, office buildings weren't air conditioned. One cabin or something may be air conditioned. So he did one for ECIL uh, in Hyderabad, which had a, a large sort of pergola in the roof. And um, he allowed for sort of two inches of water, standing water, to be on the roof. So that that would be, a, would ke uh, sort of cool the, the uh, concrete slab and and actually sort of cool the building. At least that's what he sort of experimented with. It it, um, it worked for as long as they kept water on the roof. But I don't. I, I mean, I, I know for sure it doesn't. Um, it's not you know that way anymore. Um, the the another thing was the double height verandas in developing this sort of urban typology. Uh, he explored the idea of the veranda, which wraps around the living uh, spaces, protecting them from the strong weather conditions. Scaling the veranda to a double height produced an active public space within the stack of homes. And this device resulted in a play with the interlocking cross-section of the individual units. And this you can see in, in several uh, of the apartment buildings, but then in its most sort of magnificent form, I think, in, in the Kanchenjunga apartment building, which again we have in the exhibition as a, as a wonderful little model of the whole building, but also a cross-section showing you how the interlock works, which is very nice. Um, there's sky lobbies that, that um, worked around the basic uh, skip stop elevator to uh, generate a typology in housing that was more humane and public. By, by doing the uh, skip stop, it was a much cheaper way of putting in elevators in low income housing because you didn't, the elevator didn't stop at every floor. So it stops at every third floor. Um, you either walk up a flight or walk down two flights. I think um, uh, 
Cert did this in Peabody Terrace in, in um, the Harvard housing that he did for students. But um, Charles then used that, the, the floor that the elevator did stop at as a way to, at times, make for, for community space at that level. And that became a, another kind of development of a typology which was very interesting and, and there's quite a few housing projects with, with that. Um, the ritualistic pathway which he talks about in the essay as well. Um, where the courtyards uh, most identified with his oeuvre of architecture were indeed key in his thinking, as uh, most evident in the uh, in a set of the projects, which um, are here, and you can see them. Where the courtyards are not just spaces between rooms, but are indeed spaces which um, that generate the building because they're part of the program is is um, in the courtyards. So rather than just being additions to the program rooms, the courtyards and terraces, and especially in that climate, could be used. And so he used them, you know, in um, with sort of light and circulation around. And and um, then there was kind of, of clustering of clustering, not just in housing, which Rahul's going to talk about, but. Um, in, in office buildings as well, that using a looser arrangement within um, spaces in the office building, how that could work for um, circulation of air, for spaces to step out into um, that were shaded, and and um, uh, you know that that was something that happened in in several of the office buildings, which I'll again um, describe to you in the exhibition. And the the last thing was was I think perhaps a, an important aspect of of Charles's work was what I call buildings as essays, and and the intellectual and political urgency with within societies which re raises you know uh, debates that ge um, and generate responses in many forms, and I, I think here you know the architect aware of his role as a social and cultural practitioner also contributes and and in this case and with built form ideas where proposals for the buildings produce an argument of sorts charting a response that wishes to tap on a creative strength of human um, society and and there are two um, projects I mean, one one was um, a kind of think tank for the Prime Minister of India, where um, you, you, the think tank was a courtyard, but you could only get to that courtyard if you went through one of the residential spaces. So you had to be living there for that week or whatever that the that the ex the think tank was happening, and and you know, and and go through that. So so in a way. By defining those thresholds, you came into a space that um, really the courtyard became that central point. But it, it was more the kind of the the sort of argument for creating a space like that. And the same with uh, a design for Ayodhya, which was a much contested uh, and still is um, a, a space which which both. Um, Sort of the Hindus and the Muslims feel is part of 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 their heritage, and so how to how to have a common ground between religions was really important. And Charles felt very um, importantly that that the role and the responsibility of an architect was to use architecture as an agent of change, and that. Uh, was something that I think perhaps was is his legacy among the 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 general public to understand his his point of view in uh, or his position in in society. But I'm going to turn it to. So can I, to, I to was going to add a yeah, couple of things yeah. if I may, yeah. and then pass it on to. Uh, uh, two other things strike me about his work. Uh, 
Uh, one certainly is, you know, he was a modernist, and so he comes from that tradition. He was educated in, in, uh, in the States, but went back and practiced in India. And he is, I think, one thinks of him as a, as a very much an Indian architect based in India, but he has a sensibility from all around the world. So he, his work, he experimented a great deal with it. And two things, one was that he used uh, the mandala in some of his buildings, which was a kind of, it wasn't a game exactly, but it was sort of for a, a part of that ritual pathway and how people would look at space and how you'd move between spaces. And as you know, the mandala is a sort of cosmic diagram, which um, uh, has been used in India for centuries and used uh, elsewhere for that matter in other, other societies. The other thing that I always struck me is that his use of color, and it's always interesting to me that for some reason, people in hot climates use lots of color, and people in cold climates don't. They always use white or black or gray. And you think it'd be the opposite. You think you'd want some color in cold climates, but, uh, but it doesn't work. And I remember once uh, we were wondering, we were in Mexico to, uh, with, with Charles and uh, with uh, Legoreta, mm -hmm. who is the well-known Mexican architect. And we were wandering around, and both he and Charles were having conversations about color. And they went on, and they said they felt really comfortable with each other, the ones from Mexico and ones from the other, because they both use color in different and bright colors, you know, the oranges and the reds and the yellows. And, and they both were wandering around, sort of congratulating each other in a sense that we understand what this is about and what architecture really is. It's about this color, and it's about shadow and shade as well as the sun. So it's sun's important, but not part of the world as you've named the exhibition really deals with, with shade as well. So I think this one could go on and talk about lots of different aspects of his work, but I think you've outlined some of his major concerns, if you like. Uh, but he's got a lot of other yeah, ones and experiments that he's done. I would urge you to look at his publications, and we've got a bunch of them here. Yeah, I just um, brought some, and they're going to be in the library. Yeah, there, and so. his work. And as I mentioned, I think I deal with Charles in my work on on the Asian architect. Mm -hmm. So some of you have taken that course, and some maybe will do that next semester as well, because I will do that next. But it's that range of things which is quite extraordinary. And I don't know if you're going to talk about some of those kinds of things he was interested in. So I'll yeah. pass it on to Raoul. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I might sort of add some things on housing Absolutely. and urbanization, because, uh, yeah. but you know, I just want to uh, go back to uh, your introduction, Stephen. and. You made a, and I, you made a very interesting slip. You said place in the sun instead of place in the shade. No, which is actually very interesting. Uh, it's interesting for two reasons. One is that his famous lecture at the, the Cubit Memorial in, Lecture in before London, he got the yeah. RIBA gold medal was called Place in the Sun, oh, and, and and then he, yeah, yeah, right. and then he he wrote an essay, and which is what this exhibition is based on, or his book, um, which was a compilation of his essays, which is Place in the Shade, and it's interesting that here we have really want to make a place in the sun, and in India yeah. we want to make a place in the shade. It was Sherban so, Kanta Kuzino you know, said that yeah. it should be called a place in the shade, shade so that's why he sun. did a. Yeah. So that's no, it's interesting both work and it's also in a way related uh, to your comment about uh, colors which is really uh, uh, an important insight and sort of related to the shade and the sun you know I mean and this is things people have discussed but I thought it, it's a good forum to push this a little bit which is that I think as as architects and societies we uh, architecture historically responds to nature and so that's why minimalism comes out of Finland where they only see snow or they see no light for six months and, and the films of Bergman and you know the brooding skies and all of that. And it's uh, no coincidence that uh, in Malaysia you don't mind wearing a shirt which is boutique with you know flowers coming out of it which you do very carefully. You might do it in Hawaii but you'd be very careful doing it in Finland for example. And so design generally perhaps is you know, at some deep level influenced by 
what the natural systems it's situated in. And, uh, and Barragan and Logretto, I mean, Barragan's colors come out of Bougainvillea because mm -hmm. that's in profusion in, 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 um, in Mexico. And so therefore, it's these strong colors, which is what those Bougainvillea flowers are. And of course, he's written about it and things. So it's interesting that you made that observation and that you know Charles, I think, felt confident about using color, both because of the sun and because of you know the tropical kind of uh, climate of India. You both also said two things, which is what I'll pick up on. Uh, she, you, Nandita, ended with the idea of the architect as an agent of change. And Hassan, you sort of alluded to this idea of him being able to slip between the Western education that he sort of was, um, you know, uh, that he benefited from, in a sense, and the condition in India. And I think that's very important. Both those points are very important to frame his work. Uh, and uh, so I think, as I've sort of, I wrote in his orbit, that he had a very specific idea of India. Uh, and he had an imagination of India when he got back. Uh, it was an India of Nehru. It was an India of kind of reinventing the nation in a sense. And modernism as an aesthetic, as a, uh, an attitude, was very critical in that imagination. But that imagination was constructed in a highly pluralistic way because I think the influences uh, on his work, I mean, you know, Bachminister Fuller was one of his teachers. Um, he studied with Kepish, who had a particular way of looking at the world. Um, he was influenced deeply by the films of Satyajit Ray, uh, which began to identify uh, uh, without fetishizing, but identify in very deep ways uh, a society that was struggling to become modern. Uh, and, uh, and so I think, and there are many, many more such folks that he was deeply influenced by. And I think his education in the United States at MIT in particular equipped him really incredibly well to be able to understand this in an analytical way, uh, which uh, I think was very important reflecting about, uh, reflecting on his kind of contribution. So he had a very kind of incisive, very aware, very objective reading of the kind of context he was working in. And I think that comes from what you put your finger on, which is the ability to you know, be able to connect with both these worlds and to be able to see uh, what was happening in India from, from without, without yeah. being away from it, but also being immersed very deeply in it. Uh, and then I think, Nandita, you picked up this idea of uh, being an agent of change. And I think that's what we can I think learn from a practice like Charles Correa's and his contributions because I think at least to me what it really highlights deeply for us is a question that we should all be asking is what is the agency of architecture and, and planning and design? Uh, you know, we are all engaged with these practices and, and I think uh, we struggle with it. It's, it's a, we are frustrated often with it because what is that agency? And I think his work really shows us, and of course it was a particular moment which is different from today, but his work really demonstrates uh, what the potential of that agency can be. And you know, his sort of work that Therefore, I think to support that idea was threefold. One was it was the production of architecture, uh, which is, I think, what the exhibition shows beautifully. And Nandita touched upon the kinds of themes that existed that nourished the way he imagined the world and the built environment. The other was this ability to reflect. Uh, uh, and that, I think, came from his education. And that came from very much an education that the United States uh, provided him, which is to reflect objectively on it and write about it. And I think from, from that generation, really, he was the only one who produced a body of work, which I would say in some ways is theory, uh, where he reflected upon what he was doing, whether it was a culture he was engaging with, whether you know, at the time when people were talking about form follows function and stuff, he said form follows climate. That was radical for the time. And I think uh, Architectural Review published that essay for the first time. And then Hassan, of course, picked up on it when through Mimar and through other writings. But I mean, I think that was a radical moment where he said, look, it's really climate. Uh, 
uh, that that form follows, which is a historic truth, actually. Uh, and so I think that was very interesting. So there were many writings like this, which are all captured in this book called A Place in the Shade, uh, which Nandita, I think, just gave to your library for students to access. It's a brilliant uh, document of 20 or 30 essays, uh, which span a whole lot of issues, uh, and uh, very interesting. But they tell you how he was struggling with these issues and was writing about them uh, in a way to uh, actually um, uh, reflect upon it for, uh, for society, for the community of architects, and all of that. And the third sort of uh, aspect that I think is very important really to also contextualize many things that are in the exhibition, and of course the exhibition, you'd need a five times the size to do all of this, but was his contribution to urbanization. And I think that again is related to, to agency because I think he deeply believed that the context that you produce architecture in is also something the architect can have influence on. It's not something that we take just for granted. Of course, we should understand it, but we can also change it. And that's why I think she used the word agent of change. And he sort of looked at the city in important ways, sometimes stumbling upon it accidentally. And so he really had a great presence and a big influence on how the debate about cities uh, evolved in India. He was not only invited by the Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi to set the first commission on urbanization in 84 that wrote the first policy paper on urbanization uh, uh, in the country, uh, which was a culmination of his many experiences. So his entry into questions of urbanization occurred in 1964 when he, with two of his other colleagues, all in their very early 30s, uh, looked at the development plan of Mumbai, which was published for the first time as a development plan in our post-independence era. Till then, we had town planning schemes that were done incrementally. But in Mumbai, for the first time, Bombay then, the government published the development plan of 1964. And he and his colleagues looked at that, and they said, you know, they're proposing Bombay grows in the northern direction because the railway system was sort of the DNA that was propelling its growth. And they said this was completely incorrect, that it should actually go across the bay to Navi Mumbai or New Bombay, uh, which uh, was the formulation at the time. And you know, this is also no coincidence because he was at MIT at a time when Siddharth the Guana, when the joint center between MIT and Harvard was at its height. There was a lot of World Bank funding and agencies that were looking at Latin America. So the Chandigarh had happened. And so this optimism that architects could be part of the urban project, I think, gave these young people great confidence to actually make a proposal for a new city. Uh, and of course, this is a much more complicated story. It was a letter to the editor uh, in the newspaper reacting to the development plan. The editor of a magazine looks at it and invites these three young architects to produce a whole volume to elaborate what they were saying. That volume has influence within the bureaucracy. Before you know it, an agency set up to design this new twin town, three million people. It was the largest project for a new town at the time. I mean, Milton Keynes and others were a fraction in terms of the ambition of the population that they were going to a house uh, in this sort of uh, new city. Uh, and so that sort of led him on a whole parallel trajectory to think about urban issues, which resulted in a wonderful manifesto he wrote, which, uh, I mean, Hassan sort of was in some ways part of because Mimar republished the original version. It was called The New Landscape, where he he talked about a new landscape that was emerging in terms of how we could understand urbanization. And The Place in the Shade, the book that I was referring to, also has an extract from that yeah, essay. It has a whole, has a whole, whole. carries the whole uh, extract from it. And so this urban trajectory was very important in itself because of the influence it had. and Because suddenly it propelled a kind of new meaning and an edge to what was the agency of architecture, uh, and, and incredibly important. But it was also important for another reason, and this sort of connects and falls back to the exhibition, which is that uh, he began to think about housing uh, 
in very substantial ways. And so in 1961 was the Tube House, uh, which is in the exhibition, which is a very important project because it changed, at least in the Indian context, the debate from what was otherwise government produced three, four story buildings uh, to a low rise, high density paradigm. And it was Jane Drew who happened to be on the jury that actually recognized this as being special, that not only was it a wonderful sectional articulation, but getting the, the, the low rise high density community formation through clusters and all of that it was a complete paradigm shift in the Indian context uh, and of course Chandigarh, Chandigarh was happening and there were many such schemes in Chandigarh that obviously Charles Correa was aware of that he changed um, that he uh, that he drew on and so uh, in, 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 in 64, a few years after this is when New Bombay happens because he understands you have to also change the context. And that's followed few, a few years later by the Previ competition, which he gets invited to represent India among a host of international architects, perhaps because of the tube house, because Jane Drew and others suddenly recognized there was talent here and someone thinking about housing. And so Navi Mumbai or New Bombay as an urban plan is sandwiched between these two projects. And and I believe you have to look at them as a tripartite to understand how his ideas of urbanism, which was about you know, how mobility can be used to indirectly cross-subsidize housing, how low-income uh, housing really needs to be incremental, how you provide the context for housing and let people build. It's not about delivery only. He began to actually populate the debate, uh, which, was, which was a debate that was happening internationally. So I, 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 I'm not arguing that these were all his original thoughts, but he was contextualizing it for India. I mean, John Turner, there was a whole shift in the way housing had to be looked at. It wasn't about delivering the end product, but it was seen as a process. Uh, and he wrote a seminal essay at that time in the Architectural Review, which I remember as a student I came across much later, which was called the Self-Help City, where he argued that the entire city, like you have self-help housing, you could imagine a city which was self-help. So if the government put in the DNA of infrastructure, housing, which is 90% of the fabric of any city, could be built by people themselves. And so so there were again four themes that I think appear very consistently in all his housing work, and that's an interesting lens to look at the housing projects, which was incrementalism, which is that housing had to be incremental, which is life corrodes housing. It is not a complete product, and that in economies that are developing, incrementalism is critical in ways investments come into the housing project, which means by nature it has to be moldable, it has to be soft, transformable, uh, in order for people to invest as their incomes grow. He, the theme of open to sky spaces, because he felt that in warm climates, a courtyard is as valuable as a covered room and it comes at no cost except the cost of the land, which people can then build into later if they choose to. The third was the idea of community space, which is an interesting idea because in housing, uh, how aggregation occurs is actually as important as the design of the unit. And uh, you know, one finds that is something that's really ignored uh, because people design the unit and then repeat it relentlessly thinking you've cracked the code by designing the unit and architects often have that impulse. Uh, and so here he recognized very early that aggregation was as critical. So the effort he put into how community space was formed through the way cluster design occurred was also very important. And so aggregation I think in his uh, projects become something that is worth looking at seriously. And the last was a recurring theme, which is climate, and how the house itself, how community spaces can be molded in a way to respond to climate, which could be wet, hot and wet, or wet and uh, or hot and dry, and they're dramatically different. And I think the projects that, uh, you know, that he did kind of uh, span across all of this. And so, I mean, I think uh, he did a book called Housing and Urbanization, recognizing that housing and urbanization can't be delinked. That means your imagination as an architect about housing must necessarily come from your imagination of the city. You can't, these two, you can't detach. And this is a problem in the profession today because we often get pushed into a condition where, you know, we are given housing to design. And if you have no idea about the city, uh, 
it's likely that it's not going to be a very potent kind of solution. Uh, and so I think this connection he articulated quite beautifully in his writings uh, and highlighted. And so it was really between 1964 when he started thinking about urbanization to 1984 when he finally wrote the Commission on Urbanization report for the government was the culmination and the development over these two, two three decades uh, of his thinking about urbanization. And in parallel, he was producing a lot of housing, which was also propelling his imagination of what the uh, city would be. And I believe the culmination of a lot of these ideas are in the Belapur housing scheme, which is also prominent in the exhibition where uh, CITCO, that is the authority for New Bombay, finally invited him three decades later to design housing. And he, he, he designed a project. It was really ironic because they'd had two projects. One was a project they did, which was called mass housing. They called it mass housing. And it was a cluster of five-story buildings and 20 blocks like that. And the site next to it they gave to Charles Correa, where he developed incremental housing in a very kind of organic pattern, learning from the in intelligence of squatter settlements, how communities are organized. And you know, there are a stark contrast when you look at them on a Google image. Uh, one is, one looks like something that has evolved over centuries, and the other is empty. It's this modernist project, which is not even occupied to date. And, and ironically, Sitko titled one mass housing, and the other they call the artist's village, mm -hmm. because they felt that uh, they won't be able to attract people to buy into that. So they gave a uh, uh, quota, they gave special uh, allocations to artists, because they thought someone with a bohemian lifestyle might enjoy that. Uh, and actually, it has been populated beautifully. I take my students back every year to study it. And you have beautiful, a beautiful representation of it uh, in, your, in your exhibition. And that's sort of worth looking at. And that really, for me, is a culmination of, in some ways, all his ideas about housing and about urbanization. And, and I just sort of, to end, I would just say that again, I think, I think to look at his work from the lens or, or from the question of what is the agency of design could teach us a lot. Uh, I think to, to understand the interrelationship between housing and urbanization, I think, is something that we can extract in deep ways, I think, from his practice um, and uh, his propositions. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to just bookend what Nandita said, that, that here was an architect who quite consciously uh, worked with a series of themes which he continuously reflected upon. And those themes actually go across all the way from his urban, urbanism and his imagination of the city to the smallest house he designs. It's a consistent set of issues. And it shows you how those themes, you could translate them into the word values, uh, actually then become uh, very important for us uh, to remind ourselves about how as architects we are rooted in a place and how we might propel ourselves as agents of change in a society. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, the time has come, actually. Rahul has also got a range of things that he deals with, from cities to historic preservation to, uh, to here. Have some more to hear. I no, no, no. This yet. no, go ahead. I, I, to buildings themselves, so I hope uh, hope we're going to sh see some of that. But um, I think your enthusiasm sort of reminds me of Charles as well. By the way, he has a, had the same kind of enthusiasm, and uh, the ways that he talked about things uh, very different. But uh, it's interesting for me. I think we should actually now look at some architecture, look at some projects and ideas, and I'll ask Nate perhaps to uh, hand this thing over to you. <coughs> and we'll go and join uh, and be able to look at the screen. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs>